So uh, with no further ado, let me share my screen. All right, so I assume that people can see that. So uh, great, excellent. All right, and let me just do this here so I can see you folks as well. well now that I've, give, I've given quite a few talks now on Zoom and it's challenging because you, you really, you can't really see people's expressions the way you can when you're giving a talk in a live setting. And, uh, and I find that I really miss that, but I at least figured out how to kind of overlay you onto my slides. So I see little thumbnails of you. Anyway, the, the uh, title of the talk as uh, Stephen alluded to, um, or the topic I should say is the pollination approach. So the pollination approach is an approach to the delivery of mental health care and um, I'm going to talk specifically about its application to the, to the delivery of psychedelic assisted mental health care. So oops, let me just fix that. Okay. So in, in order to motivate this, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the current approach to delivering mental health care and how that fits into some um, how that, how that fits into our broader socioeconomic context. So the current approach to, to delivering mental health care is known as the pharmaceutical approach. And the pharmaceutical approach started in the 1950s. That, that's when the first antipsychotic drugs, the first psychiatric drugs were invented. And it essentially views mental illness in much the same way as a physical disease. Uh, different forms of mental illness are defined by clusters of symptoms. And as a result, the theory goes they're susceptible to treatment by, by drugs, by pharmaceuticals. Now, the thing about the pharmaceutical approach is that it prioritizes profits over patients. So just to give you a little bit of evidence. So this chart shows global psychiatric drug revenues in three different years, 1990, and, uh, 2000, and then two, the 2020 figures are projections. And we can see that the pharmaceutical approach has gone from a global market that generated a few billion dollars a year of revenues to about 27, over $27 billion this year. So there's been tremendous growth in, in this market as this approach has taken hold. Although this approach has been lucrative for the shareholders of pharmaceutical companies, it hasn't had uh, such great success in terms of its effects on treating mental illness. So what this chart shows you is the share of the population with mental health and substance abuse disorders from 1990 to 2017. And I've included uh, lines there for the US, the UK, and then for the world. And we can see that these shares have remained relatively stable. So you might say, well, okay, the share of the, of the population that has mental health or substance abuse disorders has remained the same, but maybe a lot of these people are feeling better as a result of being treated with pharmaceuticals. But that actually isn't correct either. So what this next chart shows you, uh, a DALI uh, is a type of statistic used in public health and, and health, health economics. It's a disability adjusted life year. So a disability adjusted life year is the loss of one year of life, either from death or due to disability as the result of a specific cause. So what this chart shows you is DALIs, uh, worldwide DALIs for mental health and substance abuse disorders from 1990 to 2017. And we can see not only has there been, not only has there not been a reduction in the life years uh, lost to disability or death as a result of mental health and substance abuse disorders, the number has actually gone up. So again, there, there's no evidence at least on this broad level, that the pharmaceutical approach has really been working very well. And I did a, the same chart for the US and the UK. We can see the UK, there hasn't been any improvement. Uh, there hasn't been a decline either. The US things have actually gotten a bit worse as well. Okay, so, so far, whoops. Okay, so, so far what we've seen is that the pharmaceutical model has been really lucrative for the shareholders of pharmaceutical companies hasn't been uh, so successful in terms of helping patients, helping patients who are suffering from for different forms of mental distress. So what I want to talk about now is how the factors, the same factors that have contributed 
to the financial success of this model for pharmaceutical company shareholders have also contributed and are continuing to contribute to mental distress. So I will start with, I don't know, I'm gonna do this one thing here. All right, yeah. So I wanna start with an advertisement. So this, what this picture shows you, this is an ad from 1958. It's an ad for an antipsychotic drug. And I just, I wanna make a few points about this advertisement. First of all, the, the guy in the front is clearly the patient, the, the person who's receiving the drug. And he's got some kind of hobby. He's, he's some kind of occupation. I can't tell exactly what he's doing, but you know, he, he's, he's got something that seems to be bringing him some pleasure. He's in a house, he, he appears probably his home. There's a, he's, the kitchen is in the background, as you can see. And he's got some people who, who ostensibly care about him. The woman might be a relative, it might be his wife. The man is probably supposed to be his doctor. Now, if we fast forward to 1975, this is an ad for an, a drug to treat schizophrenia. And the conception of the patient has changed entirely. We've gone from this socially embedded individual in 1958 to in 1975, a mime, a mime, someone who is devoid of social context, presumably devoid of an, of an inner life. So what the shift is, this is a shift toward individualism, individualism, or what I would refer to as hyper-individualism. So this conception of the patient as not having social context, as not being socially embedded in any way, has been really critical to the success of the, to the financial success of the pharmaceutical model, because it makes it much easier just to think about uh, psychiatric drugs as something you prescribe to treat different symptoms. Context doesn't really matter. It's all about, it, 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 these are like diseases, just like physiological diseases, and we can treat them with drugs. So hyper-individualism uh, is one of the two values that's kind of embedded in the pharmaceutical model that's been responsible for its financial success. And which in a moment, I'll also argue has been, is also uh, led to an increase in overall rates of mental distress. The second value is what I refer to as hyper-competition. And competition is in quotes because it's not really competition. So this is the idea that markets, the unfettered market should be allowed to operate uh, free of any sort of government intervention. So the pharmaceutical industry since the early 1980s has been really pushing this point of view, pushing the point of view that the best outcomes would be achieved if government stayed as much out of the, uh, at least out of the business and ec the economic side of the pharmaceutical industry as possible. And the result as we can see is that we now have a much more concentrated pharmaceutical industry than we used to. So what the chart shows is the combined market share of the top global, of the top pharmaceutical companies on a global basis. If we look at the top four firms, we can see that their market share are more than doubled from 82 to 99. And we see a similar pattern for the top eight firms. So fewer larger firms accounting for more of the market. And although this is sold as competition, this is actually anti-competitive, it's a way of reducing competition. And that's reflected in spending on prescription drugs. So we can see the massive run up in prescription drug prices uh, from 1980 to 2015 with the US leading the pack. Um, the UK has also had substantial increases, a substantial increase in prescription drug costs. So this is the second, um, this is the second factor that has contributed to the financial success of the pharmaceutical model. Okay, so, this kind of hyper-individualism and hyper-competition, as I said, the, these have contributed to the financial success of the pharmaceutical model, but these are also um, values that have come to, um, th that are embodied in economic practices much more broadly, way beyond the confines of the pharmaceutical industry. So with these two, char with these two char charts show you, these are charts from a recent study of 80 countries where they tracked measures of individualism, of individualism. So on the left chart, we, there's, they've used a measure of individualist, individualist practices. On the right chart, they've used a measure of individualist values. And what the charts are showing you is that there have been substantial increases in individualism over the last 50 years or so across a very large 
uh, number of countries. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, this idea of market competition as being the best way to organize all sorts of activities has also expanded in, in scope. This is, I don't have statistical evidence for this one to show you on this slide. Just a quote that I think is really illustrative. This is from the Washington Post. Uh, the US Secretary of State a couple of years ago, uh, it says the day a million species are announced to be on the brink of extinction, US says melting ice creates new opportunities for trade. So the idea that, you know, as long as as long as things are helping markets work better, that's that's the the most important thing. This idea that markets are the best way to organize everything. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, it, it's pretty. It, it's been. I hope it's been clear so far how these two um, these two values, hyper individualism and hyper competition, have contributed to the financial success of the pharmaceutical model. I mentioned earlier, I also think that they've contributed to increasing rates of mental distress. And this shouldn't be surprising. It's not, really, it's not like a heretical point of view. The World Health Organization itself has uh, written that mental health is produced socially. It's not produced, it, it's not this purely individualistic phenomenon um, as is suggested uh, by the ad with the mind. So a couple of quotes in this report, uh, mental health and many common mental disorders are shaped to a great extent by the social, economic, and physical environments in which people live. And social inequalities are associated with increased risk of many common mental disorders. So if we think about inequality as being a reflection of these hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive hyper values and practices, we can actually see a distinct relationship with mental health. And this is easiest to see on a cross-country basis. So what this chart shows you is the relationship between economic inequality and mental illness across countries. And we can see a very distinct relationship. Countries that are more unequal, which again reflects a, a greater uh, embrace of hyper competitive and hyper individualistic values and practices. Those countries tend to have much higher rates of mental illness. And the, U the US is leading the pack on this chart. The UK is high up there too, as you can see. We see a very similar pattern for substance abuse. So what this chart shows you is it's, the same, it's uh, analogous, but instead of showing you the relationship between inequality and mental illness, it's showing you the relationship between inequality and illegal drug use, which is a proxy for addiction. And again, we see a distinct relationship. The more inequality you have, which again is proxying for these hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive values and practices, the more illegal drug use you have, um, which reflects uh, greater rates of addiction. Okay, so the reason that these hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive values and practices that have ascended and expanded so much, especially during the past 50 years, the reason that they've been so damaging to our, our mental health is that they have interfered with the functioning of community systems. Okay, so as humans, we, we have an innate need to connect and cooperate with each other. And we traditionally express this need through in residential communities. This goes back, you know, this goes back to, to ancient times. And, uh, and, and still true today. But these divisive conceptions, these, these, these divisive values and practices have interfered with the way that uh, community systems function. So, I, so I'm thinking when I say community here, you know, we know what when we talk about a residential community, we're clearly talking about a geographic community. And within that community, there are multiple systems. There are social systems, there are economic systems, there are natural systems. So starting with social systems, the rise of in, hyper individualism and hyper competition has created what is widely referred to now as a crisis of connection. I think it's actually more accurate to call it a crisis of disconnection. Rates of loneliness and social isolation have risen so much in the past several decades that the UK has appointed a minister of loneliness, as, as some of you are no doubt aware, and the former Surgeon General of the US has uh, made it his life's work to tackle what he refers to as the loneliness e epidemic. So it's, Pretty clear. You can see the so the, the, this relationship is is a pretty clear one. There's 
So by the way, and I, you see in, in the title of the slide, I have the word meta crisis. The crises in these individual, th th there are crises in social systems, economic systems, and natural systems that are all parallel to, to each other, and they all have the same roots. So I, I think of them as together comprising a meta crisis. So if we think about economic systems, the rise of hyper competition and hyper individualism combined with technological forces that have favored large organizations have led to the displacement of local businesses in many places by outposts of giant corporations. And one of the results of, of, this, uh, of, this, of this trend is that the bulk of the economic value being produced in local communities is extracted by distant shareholders, which not only you know, may seem unfair, but in addition, it means that the, those economic proceeds, that money that's, uh, that, 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 uh, or financial capital, if you want to think about it that way, is no longer available to recirculate in the local community where it, where, where it's, where it would be needed to drive additional investment in local spending. So the economic lifeblood is being sucked out of local communities as a result of the same forces that are driving the crisis of disconnection. So, so I refer to this as the crisis of extraction. There's one more system I'll talk about, and, and uh, this is natural systems. So in natural systems, we have what I would refer to as the crisis of depletion. So again, we have giant corporations that have come in and displaced local businesses. As a result, not only are the financial proceeds of local economic act activity being uh, extracted by distant shareholders, but in addition, decisions about how to use a community's resources are being made by distant managers who have no direct contact with the local ecosystem and are much more likely to make decisions that don't account for the sustainability of those resources. So, you know, the slide gives, gives you a couple of suggested, suggestive examples. Obviously, pollution is one. Um, but this applies not only to the depletion of uh, ecological systems, it applies also to the, to, or ecological capital, if you want to call it that. It applies also to the depletion of human capital, of people being um, basically, I mean, I don't want to be too inflammatory, but basically forced to work in a way that, uh, that makes them anxious and depressed and, and also leaves them physically ill in many cases. So again, we have parallel crises in, in all these different community systems, which are all attributable at some level to the ascent of hyper-individualism and hyper-competition. Okay. So the pollination approach uh, is, is an attempt to directly counter these forces. So at the core of this approach is a recognition of the intrinsic interdependence between the well-being of the individual and the well-being of the community. So you know, in nature, pollinator insects and animals um, basically form connections. They take pollen from one place and they put it someplace else where it can be used. So they're, they're, kind of, they, 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 they're, um, they're sustaining the health of the entire system by creating connections among different elements of the system. In the field of community economics, a pollinator organization is an organization that does, uh, that sort of is a very similar function. It renews and recirculates resources in community systems. So in the specific context of mental health care, um, a, a wellness center or a clinic that embraces the pollination or that embodies the pollination approach explicitly attempts to reconnect people to community systems. Or if we wanna put it into more kind of economics-y language, uh, wellness centers are people pollinators. Uh, they attempt to put people back into circulation. So let me go into a little bit more detail to, to, to explain that. So here we have an individual, who, and let's say this individual has recently undergone psychedelic therapy. Um, earlier, Stephen mentioned uh, Roz Watts. So, so, so Roz was the uh, lead clinician 
in the psilocybin studies that were done at Imperial College. She's now the lead clinician at the Synthesis Institute in Amsterdam. And she's brilliant. And one of the, uh, one of the papers that she's most well known for, and I see the, a body of work that she's, most well, that she's especially well known for, has to do with the channels through which psychedelics uh, lead to healing. And what she finds is that the channels through which psychedelics, or the channel through which psychedelics lead to healing are by, it's, they lead to healing by creating openness to connection. Openness to connection with self, uh, openness to connection with others, and openness to connection with nature. So somebody who is just this, this individual who's still on the screen, who has just undergone psychedelic therapy, now has an increased openness to connection. And that's part of the reason why he or she is very likely feeling better after the therapy. His or her depression has been alleviated, or maybe anxiety has been reduced. But if you then thrust that individual back into the same alienating environment that very likely contributed to their mental distress in the first place, you, 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 you're really not um, taking advantage of the full potential that psychedelics offer. So what, you, what you'd like to do instead is you would like to take advantage of this window of openness and reconnect this person to community systems. So the first level would be to connect them to other individuals within the context of the wellness center. So these could be other people who have also gone individual um, psychedelic therapy and they then uh, participate in group integration sessions together. Eventually it will no doubt be legal to have um, group therapy sessions as well. And in fact, in, in some places, it, at the Synthesis Institute, for example, in, in Amsterdam, you can currently go and participate in group psychedelic therapy sessions. So this is one way of starting to reconnect people, of starting to form these connections. But it's still insular, right? What you'd really like is to reconnect these people to systems in the broader community. And in doing so, you also help to revitalize the community systems themselves. So, wellness centers that enact the pollination approach have deep partnerships with different organizations in the, com in the community. These could be um, educational organizations, business organizations, civic, religious organizations. The idea is that um, through, these, through these deep ties, people can be reconnected to whatever organizations make sense for them to be reconnected to. And they can, in this way, become re-engaged in the life of the community, which again, has benefits for the individuals and for the community itself. I also uh, put in a picture, I, I, I don't know if it's obvious what it is, it's, I, I realize it's a little distract. There's a picture of some rolling uh, fields with some trees up there. So the idea is, uh, it's also really critical to reconnect people to natural systems. There's evidence there's, there's an increasing amount of evidence showing that reconnection to nature is also a key element in the psychedelic healing process. And so this is a, another, a, another component of the pollination approach as well. Okay, so there's actually an example um, that has a lot of these same elements from a town in England, uh, from the town of Froome. So I don't know how many of you know about what, what, what they've been up to in Froome. I understand it's, I actually haven't been there. I was supposed to visit uh, last March and then the pandemic hit, so I wasn't able to go, but I still plan to as soon as the pandemic is over. Uh, so Froome, in Froome, they, they noticed, I think it was around the year 2010 or so, that a lot of people who were coming in complaining of medical conditions said that they were lonely. And they, they decided to, ex to experiment with an approach where they treated loneliness as a medical condition. So they first trained up a bunch of people that they referred to as health connectors. And when someone came in complaining of a medical condition and also complaining of loneliness, these health connectors would try to connect them to health resources in the community. They then trained up a bunch of folks that they referred to as community connectors. And these people, their job is really just to connect lonely people who had uh, physical ailments to different types of community resources whether that be taking them to the gym or yoga class, um, taking them to um, 
you know, uh, connecting them with some kind of civic group in the community. Froome also established what they called talking cafes, which were places where you could just go and talk to other people. Okay, so this program has been um, has been uh, underway for a while now, and it's been long enough that they've been able to collect and analyze some of the data. And so what they did was they took data on various metrics like hospital visits, healthcare costs, ER admissions, and a, few, a bunch of others. And they compared what these numbers looked like in Froome at, over this period since, since this uh, program started. They compared these numbers to, this, to the same metrics for neighboring counties. That was kind of the control group. And what they found was that in relative terms, hosp uh, hospital visits in Froome had declined by 46%. Healthcare costs had declined by 42% and ER admissions had declined by 43%. The UK National Health Service estimated that for every pound that it had invested into this program, it had saved six pounds. So connecting people to community systems fosters well being. And that's really the idea at the core of the pollination approach. Clinics in the pollination approach, as, I, as I, they're not just clinics, they're community institutions, they're multimodal wellness centers whose focus is not on psychedelic therapy per se, but on reconnecting people to community systems. And psychedelic therapy is a tool that's used um, as part of that process. Okay, so um, the last kind of topic I wanna to talk about uh, in relation to the pollination approach is that of organization and finance. And we won't go too deep into this. We can always talk about this more during the Q&A if that's desired. The main point that I, I wanna make here is that the, the pharmaceutical model embodies the value of shareholder primacy. The value of shareholder primacy says that um, the interests of shareholders should be prioritized above those of, of all other stakeholders. And this value is deeply embedded in our system, especially in countries like the US and the UK. In, in the specific context of mental health care, the, this, the, the value of shareholder primacy is extremely problematic because the production of well-being, which is what the pollination approach is about, the production of well-being does not result in the greatest profits for a concentrated set of financial shareholders. I mean, all we have to do is look at the pharmaceutical approach and we, we, we can see that it's much more profitable to uh, manage chronic diseases than it is to make people well. Now, this doesn't mean that the pollination approach and the production of well being aren't profitable in some sense. In fact, I would say that the production of well being, that actually truly relieving people of their mental distress, not just by treating them as psychedelics, but also by getting to the sources of it, um, has widespread economic and social returns for the entire community. But conventional approaches to ownership, to governance, to financing, all embody this value of shareholder primacy. And so in that way, they sustain the existing paradigm of disease management, the, the pharmaceutical approach, and hinder, hinder the development of a new paradigm, a paradigm of wellness production. So, so structures that support the pollin pollination approach counter conventional approaches in several ways. So one of the key elements is local ownership and operation. First off, different communities have different pattern, different cultures, obviously, different trauma patterns, different types of recirculatory gaps. So you want there to be local determination just to have the most effective treatments possible. But in addition, when you have local ownership, you counter that extractive influence that we talked about earlier. If you have local ownership, the economic proceeds being created by the wellness center are available to recirculate locally revitalizing or, or contributing to the revitalization of the local economy. Um, upfront, as these clinics, uh, as these wellness centers start to develop once legalization occurs, um, and there's already a lot of talk going on about this in places like the US and, and Canada, where I, I think we're closer um, than you are in the UK right now, it's critical to have aligned sources of seed capital that um, recognize that the, the mission here is to nurture prototypes 
of this new approach, prototypes uh, for wellness production. So to have aligned sources of capital that allow these uh, new entities to offer their services in a way that's relatively unconstrained by conventional financial pressures. Okay. So that, that's in the first phase. And I have a bunch of specific ideas about that, which again, I won't, I'm not gonna do a deep dive on them right here, but I'm very happy to talk about them in the Q&A. The one other point I do wanna make here is about what things look like over the long term. I mentioned earlier that the production of wellness has widespread economic and social benefits. So there's no doubt in my view that these the wellness centers embodying the pollination approach can be self-sustaining. But part of the work that's going, that needs to go on and which is starting to go on right now is coming up with novel financial mechanisms to capture some of the ec economic benefits being created to, for, in the community and use them to support these wellness centers. So I just wanna go back to this chart. This is the chart of disability life years from mental health and substance abuse disorders. And I showed here the lines for the US and the, and the UK. Every, every reduction in DALIs as they're called is an additional, every one year reduction is an additional year of someone's life that they're able to be engaged in the community and economically productive. So I think this is, you know, I think this really does indicate the potential magnitude of the um, economic benefits that this approach can create. And again, it's a matter of figuring out how to um, use some of these benefits to uh, support these centers going forward. Anyway, I've already said more than I had planned to. So I'll leave the rest for q and I'll just make a couple of con concluding points. The first is that the pharmaceutical model embodies divisive economic conceptions that have paired, impaired mental health by disrupting community systems. So that's, that's what I talked about at the beginning. The pollination approach reconnects people to community systems to produce both individual and collective healing, which, which are intrinsically interdependent. The, if, if you wanna compare the core logic of the pollination approach to that of the existing approach, the, the difference is that the pollination approach focuses on the production of well-being, whereas the pharmaceutical approach focuses on the management of disease. And finally, the pollination approach aspires to serve as more than a conventional business model and as a source of healing itself. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bennett. Um, wow, this is a, a topic that I'm really passionate about. So there's a, a lot of questions I could ask here, so let's see. Um, let me just start off with, with this, which is, I mean, you'll be aware, many of the people watching will be aware that huge amounts of money have already flowed into the psychedelic space, big, big psychedelic, we might think of it, you know, along the lines of big pharma, and Compass have done their IPO, and sort of have a valuation of more than a billion, and so on, and my med and field trip that I think have got multi-million valuations that are, and that, you know, they're all going, seem to all be going down this very traditional uh, you know, sometimes VC funded, which is like shareholder um, owned and led Absolutely. approach. Yeah. Um, so, like, my uh, don't want to put a downer on things, and we'll, you know, we'll maybe we'll we'll get onto some of the more kind of positive stuff. But, but, like, has this ship sailed? You know, like, it, yeah. they are, it, like, what is the opportunity for yeah. the innovative approaches, given that actually some companies are already operating at some scale? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a great question, and and I also think it's you know, very reasonable to be concerned about, about this, but I, I'm actually quite optimistic. So on the one hand, you do have this portion of the field that is populated by kind of business as usual, extractive actors, Compass is the poster child. And you know, what Compass wants to do, I don't know if people, if everybody is familiar, Compass, Compass currently is in, in the US at least, is in phase three clinical trials with the FDA. Um, with psilocybin. They're using psilocybin to treat treatment-resistant depression. And they've been pursuing a patenting strategy. They filed for 27 patents, I believe. Um, none of those, all but one of those claims failed, which is good news. So now they've got one patent. And, they're, and they want to deliver psychedelic therapy in a vertically integrated system. They want to produce the drug, control the clinic, it, it, and everything in between. 
which is also can also be a way of stifling competition. Okay, so that, that that's frightening. But that sort of monopolistic behavior is can only be successful if you're if you're actually a monopolist and there's no viable alternative to present the challenge. Mm -hmm. In the market for psilocybin, we have a couple of organizations. First, there is USONA. So USONA is in phase two clinical trials with the FDA for its psilocybin. And the, uh, the condition that it's treating is major depressive disorder, which is actually a, a much larger market than treatment resistant depression. And USONA, USONA is a nonprofit medical research organization. Um, they, are, they are dedicated and, and just Full disclosure, I, I serve on their clinical advisory boards, but the reason I do that is I believe deeply in what they're doing. And they want to make psilocybin therapy uh, available to as many people at as low a cost as possible. So their psilocybin, they will sell their psilocybin at uh, rates that are just slightly above cost in most. And if they file for any patents, they'll be for defensive purposes, not to monopolize the market. So that still leaves the whole other part of the value chain. If you want to again go back to like business speak, we saw who's, who's going to operate the clinics, and you know, are we going to just see chains of clinics buying psilocybin from Usona and and and, and then replicating this model? Well, mm -hmm. and, and I think yeah, go ahead. And do you, and uh, do you anticipate those those kind of different models coexisting, or do you think uh, and do you, or maybe do you hope that the uh, the kind of synthesis Usona direct pollination direction actually kind of like wins out and i guess i know the answer to i mean that. <laughs> well i mean obviously i'd rather see that I, they yeah. they might coexist you know and, and there are yeah. other there are definitely other kind of traditional corporate players in the space or, or startups that are pursuing these more kind of old school um monopolistic models trying to mm -hmm. patent things um but i i think i think the broader answer to your question and I didn't really get into this in the talk so much, I, or the, maybe I alluded to it a little bit. Uh, I, I think there's a bigger shift that, that's afoot. And that's a shift to, from an extractive form of capitalism to a regenerative form of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think at the end of the day, the regenerative, form, regenerative capitalism is going to prevail. Mm -hmm. And I have very specific reasons why I think that. I don't know how far you want me to, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I try to give I, I try to give you like a two minute version. So sure, yeah, okay. So there, there are a couple reasons I think that. So first of all, as I mentioned during the talk, we're in a state of meta crisis. If if you look at um, if you look at work on complex adaptive systems, and we're talking about syst complex adaptive systems that are in crisis, when a complex system is pushed a little bit out of balance, it has a very strong tendency to uh, move back to its initial equilibrium. So like in the late 60s, we had a lot of stuff happening in the US. We had the, the, the hippies and civil rights and it looked like the system was really gonna get thrown out of whack but it didn't get thrown out, out of whack enough. And so then in the 80s, it actually became almost a, even a, a caricature of what it had been before. Mm -hmm. It really like kind of doubled down. But the state we're in now, now I would say that we're in a state of near chaos and and in order for a complex system to emerge a fundamentally different um, logic, uh, a, what we refer to as a higher order level of complexity, you have to hit a state of near chaos. So what's mm -hmm. happening right now is creating the conditions in my view for fundamental change to occur. Mm -hmm. So how do we know what direction that change will take? I mean, we, we, don't, we can't know for sure, but there are a couple, there are a couple, of, you know, there are a couple of things that make me optimistic. One is that, the reactions we're seeing right now are even even among those even among like Trump supporters and stuff like this. They, they may their reactions may be misguided, but what's causing them to behave the way they are is still is this is the fact that they've been completely alienated by exactly the hyper competitive hyper individualistic values and practices that that, that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So there's already the impetus there and. Part of the trick is, you know, getting people to wake up to what the real problem is. Yeah. But the, the and we could talk more about that. But a, another piece of this, which I think is critical, is technology. One of the reasons that the existing paradigm, that which just you know populated by these giant corporations, has evolved the way it has, is that the technology, the, the communications and production technologies, for the 
really starting with the agricultural revolution, but especially for the past couple of hundred years since the industrial revolution have, fa have increasingly favored larger organizations. They, they favored bigness. So that, that gave these giant corporations a big advantage. But if we look at technological trends today, first of all, on the communication side, we now have distributed communications, not just the internet, but we also now have the rise of distributed ledger technologies, uh, like the one that's used for Bitcoin, for example. And the power of these technologies is not that they, you can use them to create you know, fake money. I mean, I, I'm a fan of cryptocurrency too, but some cryptocurrency is just kind of a copy of fiat currency you know, using, using computers. The, 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 the real uh, potential of these is that they, they provide the ability to have distributed coordination and distributed governance without having to have people in the same giant organization. So they're undermining the basis for large organizations. On the production side, um, we have 3D printing, eventually we'll have carbon nanotech. So the forces that created economies of scale and favor large organizations on the production side are also dissipating. Mm -hmm. but I think that, I think when you sum all this stuff up is, you know, I think technology is gonna push us. It, I mean, the irony is that prior to the agriculture revolution, we had a settlement pattern which was widely distributed and people lived in local communities and everything was about the thriving of the community. And that pattern wasn't sustainable for a while. And, and ironically, technology is gonna allow us to return to a pattern that looks more like that. So that's my, I tried to, mm. I think I kind of kept that to a point. Thanks, yeah. Small, small is gonna be beautiful again. Yeah. So, psychedelic businesses have an opportunity, not just to like, you know, spread you know the, the kind of healing potential of psychedelics but actually to change business you know to change to, to turn business into a uh, towards a more kind of like co cooperative and decentralized direction i think actually that's almost almost a bigger prize or at least kind of you might say as big <laughs> so yeah so 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 you know a couple of first of all there, there's a guy named dave magahi who um who's the executive director of north star which is a project mm -hmm. to ensure integrity and the delivery of psychedelic therapy he had he came up with a great catchphrase i'd like to take credit for it but it's his <laughs> so we're, he said it's not just about business models for psychedelics it's about psychedelic models for business so right, I, that's right. pretty much what you're saying yeah yeah so um uh yeah so so there is you know so there is work going on in this area there's a um there's actually another uh project out of the uk uh there's a guy named Jules Peck who, who started it called mm -hmm. Cyval. Mm -hmm. know about Jules and Cyval. So this yeah. is this is using psychedelics to promote systems change. So working with you know, um, philanthropists, corporate executives, you, know, you name it. Maybe politicians eventually for exactly the type type of uh, purpose that you're talking about. Also, I'm in the early phases of with some co-authors of developing a study to assess whether, um, and I, I, you're not supposed to say this ever, but I, I know what the answer is <laughs> to, to assess whether psychedelic experiences lead to greater connectedness in decision-making by business leaders. Mm, so basically nice. kind of testing the, the hypothesis that motivates uh, Jules's project. So yeah, yeah I, I, I totally agree with you. So, so you know, I guess one, one little tidbit I'll mention here, which I, I, I might've also, I, I could have mentioned uh, in response to the earlier question about why I'm optimistic about systems change. So I, do you know about the three point, I don't like this term, but do you know about the 3.5% rule? Have you, you guys heard about this? Uh, is this a kind of tipping point theory of social change? But yeah. go ahead, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's basically what it is. I mean, they, they did a study and they, they, they looked at, um, um, they compared non, they had a data set that spanned like a hundred years and they, they compared nonviolent protests to violent protests. I don't remember how big the sample was, but they had, you know, they, it was very comprehensive. It was in countries all over the world. So first of all, they found that nonviolent protests were on average more likely to achieve their goals than violent protests were. But more to the point of what we're talking about, they also found that in order for the average nonviolent protest to succeed, it needed to reach an average of 3.5% of the population. And then you got to a tipping point and then the idea took off. So when you think about it that way, that, 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 that's, that's a lot more attainable, you know, because otherwise, you know, I think my, your default is probably to think, well, we got to convince at least 50% of the people out there mm -hmm. to, to change the way they think. But that's actually really not the way things work. And, and then imagine that you don't just influence a random 3.5%, but you manage to get on board with this whole program 
a very influential 3.5%. Mm -hmm. But the power of social, you can really leverage the power <laughs> of social networks. So I don't yeah. want to sound too like, you know. Well, this was, this was about it, but... um, I, I understand this was actually a key point of disagreement between Albus Huxley and Timothy Leary back in the day, that Huxley had exactly this kind of theory. He just thought psychedelics should actually be kept as quiet as possible and kind of just introduced to very specific groups of people already, already with some power and influence in society. Whereas Leary yeah. was like, no way, let's just, yeah. let's just like shout about it. Let's just get them out into the world. And so you know, if, we, if, it, if we believe that maybe the 70s ended up being a bit more to, you know, Leary's strategy, maybe it's not so bad to sort of give Huxley's a go. <laughs> I, I, I think that, that Leary, you know, was not great in the long run for the psychedelic movement. Um, mm -hmm. And I would, a third name I would add to the kind of pantheon who doesn't get as much attention is Stan Groff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they recently, um, they came out with a movie about him called The Way of the Psychonaut, mm -hmm. which I, I highly recommend. I think you can probably stream it. I'm sure it's mm -hmm. online someplace. And uh, it's just, if you're interested in psychedelics, it's just go yeah. check it out. You know, nice. everybody's got time on their hands. <laughs> And it's your um, so it's we're just a couple of minutes to seven. So I just I need to just going to ask one more question before we open up to questions from the audience, um, which is so, so the uh, point of curiosity for me really. So the Netherlands, so like um, psilocybin truffles or well psilocybin mushrooms were legal in the Netherlands for a long time. Even even when those got banned, like the truffles were were available. Actually, I don't know what you, whether you know this, but even before synthesis were running retreats, the psychedelic society was running retreats, which is that's right. a branch of the organization that's now become Al Al Ho, um, who are kind of <laughs> hoping that COVID clears up so they can start putting those retreats on again, as I'm sure synthesis are. But anyway, like the um, so. Yeah, but it, anyway, one way or another, it's been possible to work with psilocybin in the Netherlands basically forever. Like, so, so, um, what, why don't, why don't we see some of these structures already existing in the Netherlands, given there haven't been any legal barriers there? And like the benefits of psychedelic, you know, medicines, wellness have been well known for at least a few decades. Any thoughts on that? So, when you say these structures you're talking about, kind of like, pollination approach types of yeah exactly like why that why like there as far as i know there are no kind of networks of psychedelic wellness centers in the netherlands you know now they're yeah. starting to pop up only in the last couple of years as you mentioned with, yeah with you know that's a great and so, on. so so like what's what's going on there like and if and is that is that like you know are there good reasons why they don't exist yeah like, it's a great question and I, I could probably you know conjure up a a, a plausible sounding answer but i suspect that I don't have a lot of specific knowledge of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that the answer lies somewhere in there. I mean, for example, like, like take for, so, you know, in, this is relevant. I'm not trying to change, change the subject. Mm -hmm. They just passed this, this legislation in Oregon, mm -hmm. which is going to, which is going to make it legal to have psychedelic clinics starting in about a year. Mm -hmm. It's two years. So, because they are concerned about corporate influence, there are a bunch of restrictions in the legislation. So you basically can't open a chain. And in order to start a clinic, you have to have residency, at least initially, you have to have had residency in this state for at least two years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe the Netherlands had, you know, there could have easily been some sorts of restrictions that might have. Yeah impeded that I, I don't know if the answer is anything deeper than that well i'll tell you i'll tell you well, some, some my something i think is relevant um, and it kind of speaks to this, the ongoing debate around like decriminalization versus legalization and uh, you may know there's a, a an organization decriminalized nature that sure. i think let me get the slogan right they're saying like no uh, no legalization without decriminalization or decriminalization right. first right. which i which i have a lot of sympathy for and so this is the idea that like um, if you're going to be able, if, if some organizations and, and it, it's likely going to be some, you know, like a shareholder owned, very wealthy corporations are going to be able to be making money from psychedelic therapy, um, you know, at or before that point, it should already be the case that no one is getting in trouble, like legal trouble, you know, crim having criminal issues yeah. with si the sim the simply the personal use of, of psychedelic medicines. I think that's a totally reasonable point of view. And that is, it, um, yeah, that I, I, my sense is that, psychedelics to the cyber truffles and uh, have been and, and cannabis actually in the Netherlands uh, they are used fairly wide in a fairly wide fashion in Dutch society but in a kind of uh 
in that kind of like more personal and, and private way and maybe a lot of these maybe there are similar things going on but it's just a little bit more kind of underground and, and behind the scenes and I think actually this is I think that's important I think we should uh, consider whether at least in some communities or in some situations actually that's a sufficient or even perhaps better way of doing things of just allowing kind of like these these very powerful substances and these kind of these experiences to happen in a slightly more quiet way without necessarily kind of erecting a sign being like you know come here for your psychedelic yeah. therapy and I think and, and I guess I think there's a balance you know and like um, you may have seen something that the um, North star uh for all the fact the people behind the north star project also did was a, we shall call it parlor i think it's yeah, like yeah. Graf that graphic was... the graphic yeah. novel where like the, the kind of end slide is like it's kind of like times square with like yeah. flashing neon adverts yeah. for like get your 5 meo dnt psilocybin therapy and like they're kind of showing a real kind of the, the potential influence of the advertising industry yeah, on the psychedelics yeah. i guess and yeah. just you know I, that i um, you know whether it's cooperatively owned or not like that doesn't feel like a, like a good place to get no, I to totally you know? I think, and I think yeah. there's some, and, and it's um, like I kind of desire there to remain a certain kind of like kind of mystery or just quiet around these substances in some way and just such that there's something that people kind of come to when they're ready in to you know to some extent I, said, I think there's a balance yeah, yeah, any no, I, I, yeah sure I, I do I mean I, first of all I, I generally agree with you it, it, by the way the, the person that I think um, was primarily or largely responsible for writing We Will Call It Paula is Dave, Dave Magahi, the guy that I mentioned earlier, the mm -hmm. one who also came up with psychedelic uh, uh, models for business. So mm -hmm. he, he, he's very clever. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just want to emphasize I, you know, a core element of the pollination approach is community ownership, community operation. Every clinic should have the, the imprint of its local community. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think, I'm totally with you. I don't think we should have big glitzy signs and flashing lights. And what, what I would like to find is a way to support um, wellness centers that really function as community institutions, which is, I, which is what I think you're talking about too. Now, the, here is where, so we will go a little farther down the rabbit hole now. Here, here is where your question about compass comes back in. So if you think about, you know, so there is this concern, well, if we have these big corporately owned centers, how are these independently, you know, community owned clinics going to compete? And in terms of the delivery of service itself, the delivery of care, the, big corporate chains don't have any advantages. The, the substance costs what it costs. You still have to have your know, therapists there and they, they cost what they cost. Where the corporate chains might have some advantage is in terms of um, backbone infrastructure services. So um, billing, data collection, uh, re regulatory management. So a, a lot of the, so a lot of the work that I'm doing now, not, not just by myself, but with others, is around setting up structures to provide those services for independently owned and operated clinics in order to, to level the playing field for them with these corporately owned entities. And this is already happening, this is already happening because you have ketamine clinics here in the US. And there's now a couple of corporately owned chains of ketamine clinics, and you have the independents. So yeah, so 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 I would view, and I would also even view, like when I think about this possible future in which synthesis is helping to set up clinics for USONA, I don't think that means that synthesis necessarily, you know, has, a, has like a corporately owned chain of clinics. I think it means that they provide support services for, well, one possibility is they provide support services for locally owned and operated clinics. And yeah. th there's one, here in the US, there's, because there was a lot of concern about the role of corporate influence um, on the delivery of healthcare services, including psychological services, 35 states have um, laws that restrict corporate, certain types of corporate activity 
in um, the delivery of mental health care. So, mm -hmm. for example, in a lot of states, if you want to uh, if you want to have an organization that delivers uh, therapy, you have to it has to be a what's called a psychological corporation. Mm -hmm. And the only shareholders in that corporation, the shareholders all have to be psychologists, or maybe there are certain other other mm -hmm. certifications mm -hmm. that that are allowed. So if you want to have another, if you want to have a company that's involved in any other aspect of operating the clinic, including the billing and administration, all that stuff, it has to be a separate, a separate entity. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually a, a legal designation for that type of entity. It's called a uh, MSO, a management services organization. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, these, th these structures already exist that are actually, I think, going mm -hmm. to be very helpful in mm -hmm. setting up the types of systems that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I hope that wasn't too long-winded an answer, but this is no, this is a big topic of, a dis of discussion recently. That's great, and I mean it's it, it's just so exciting um, that you know you're you're talking kind of about the theory of the pollination approach, but actually it's kind of happening right now, and or at least starting to. And so um, it it, abs uh, it absolutely. Is. I mean, I, I I had a conversation. Well, I'm having a conversation on about it on Monday with Maps's new director of commercialization. I mean, it's really like it it, it really it's re I, in, in the nonprofit part of this space, mm -hmm. uh, it really resonates with people. And I'm not saying yeah. that's like toot my own horn. I'm just saying like, yeah. I, I really think, you know, these people, every, people get it and they want to see real change. Sure. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, uh, I think speaking for most people at the Psychedelic Society, I can say that we get it. And as you, as you know, that yeah, well, the organization I, behind yeah. the Psychedelic yeah. Society is already a worker cooperative. So yeah. super excited to kind of like, you know, stay involved and if and when the law changes at least they'll be kind of helping rolling out some of these like these wellness centers yeah, here, totally. here in the uk so we'll see how we go Prototype. okay so let's take some questions from our uh, the gallery here uh, so I, I believe you should be able to unmute yourselves so maybe just rate if you want if you have a question just raise your hand um either with your video on or you can use the zoom function and i'll call your name and then you can ask it anybody uh, who's that? Kenny, yeah. Great, thank you. And yeah, thank you, Bennett, for a really stimulating paper and talk, which, yeah, just outlines a version of the future that really resonates. Um, so thank you for that. I guess my, my question uh, is one around kind of legislation and regulation, which you started to touch on just at the end of some of your answers. But I guess I'd just be interested to hear some of your thoughts on as this uh, as these conversations begin to emerge and new emerging legislation and regulation begins to come about. What are the kind of like key elements, I guess, or facets we should be lobbying for, which would enable a kind of pollination approach, and which which will, I guess, uh, I guess in my head I can foresee some of the barriers that might come around like licensing and other issues, which will create. A kind of context which will only support kind of incumbent power so Absolutely. i'm just curious yeah. to hear your thoughts on that yeah yeah so i i do think there, there is a tendency for regulation formal regulations do tend to support existing power structures so i think that's a very well-placed concern um you know if you look at what's going on right now in uh, oregon and what's also starting to go on in california too is there are groups that are you know, it, it hasn't been decided how this is going to be regulated yet. Like who's going to do the certification and who's going to decide on who's allowed to give the therapy and who's not. So although the, I will say the Oregon legislation does not require you to be an MD, which I think is good news. Um, but so let, but, but let me actually focus on your question. So, um, you know, the point I wanted to make is that this is uncharted territory. It's not clear whose regulatory domain this fits into. For example, in the US, new drugs are approved by the FDA, and that includes eventually, I would say, psilocybin and probably before that MDMA. But there's there haven't been treatments before where the drug and the therapy were both part of the same treatment. The FDA is not in the business of, of, of regulating therapists. So, it's like, so whose responsibility is it? So I think it actually creates an opportunity. I think it creates an opportunity for industry self-organization and self-regulation. And that's what I see, see starting to occur in Oregon. A number of the entities there, I believe, will probably band together to come up with their own um, certification standards. In, in a way, if the industry can, can come up with standards that are perceived as being 
credible and safe and will ensure it, it and basically will protect people from you know from harm then i think there's an opportunity to preempt uh tighter government regulation for, of for example who can give the therapy you know so does that start to kind of get at your qu question yeah I, I i really think it's i think i think it's i think it's up to us i, I guess the one other thing i would add you know, as I said, it's been it's turning out to be very helpful here in the US. And the example I was just giving to Stephen, it's turning out to be very helpful that we already had these um, these state laws in place restricting corporate activity in the provision of mental health care. So I don't know what the you know if any such laws exist in England, but it would be great if, if as this stuff starts to get you know as legalization happens if you can somehow manage to achieve those types of restrictions i, I think they really they're, they're really helpful and, and as i said that's what happened in oregon the oregon law actually prohibits it's effectively prohibits um large corporate involvement at least for the time being so yeah so i, I hope that was clear that was a little, little scattered but thank you bennett anyone else Don't be shy. I don't remember. Oh, oh, yes, we got someone from Lisa. Go ahead. I have a question, but I also want to acknowledge that Liam had a few questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, I was just starting to look at that actually. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Well, we could take and Liam, would you like to ask your question? Or if we don't hear from you, we'll just I'll just read it out now. No. Okay. So Liam asks, uh, you mentioned that every year someone is alive, that every year someone is alive, they're economically productive, but they're also economically extractive, increasing healthcare costs, etc. Does the model account for that? Also, what do you think of them in barriers to this approach? What might be some of the first steps to setting it up? Bennett, go for it. Yeah. I mean, so in terms of, so, so the point that I was trying to make uh, is that it, it, people who are suffering from major depressive disorder, severe addiction, severe anxiety are not only suffering themselves, but they're also very disconnected from the community. And I, I don't want to make this sound that comes from this stark economic sort of, you know, um, view of, of people, but they're they're, they're generally not able to contribute to the economic vitality of the community. And in fact, they're, they're also, they also create a lot of costs. I mean, people who have, um, people who are depressed or anxious, not only have greater healthcare costs for the treatment of depression and anxiety, but they also have physiological healthcare costs that are several times those of people who aren't suffering from depression or addiction or anxiety. So, the, you know, if we do want to talk about it in stark economic terms, these people are, they're, they're huge drains on the system. You know, and the approach right now is, you know, governments spend money in various types of welfare programs and treatments that aren't really effective. And it, it's not good for anybody. So if you can actually help people truly feel better and re-engage them in the community, including in community economic systems, it's a win-win. You, you reduce the, the drain that's already happening to support these people and they are likely to become economically productive again. So I think that addresses the, the first part of the question. Um, what are some of the main barriers? I feel like we've kind of had this conversation already. I think, you know, probably the, you, the, the two main concerns that people express when I talk about this are, the, one is the what, what Stephen opened up with. You know, what about these kind of corporate models, these extractive models? Is it possible to compete with them? And I've already given the reasons why I think I, I think things are going to be okay on that front. Um, what might be some first step to setting this up? The first step to setting this up, I think, is achieving buy-in from values aligned organizations in the space. And that step has already happened. So 
you know, I mean, the, the number of meetings I'm in each week with not just the organizations I mentioned, but various other, you know, participants bringing various other resources into the space from financial capital to entrepreneurial experience, you know, you, you name it, it is really, it, it's, it, I'm busy. <laughs> and, and, it, and, and, but the reason I find that so exciting is th this is, I, I feel like this is a social movement. I feel like this is, this is happening. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's already taking off and, you know, in terms of what would be the most important first step, the, the, the need that gets re-expressed over and over, and which a lot of people are working on addressing right now, is raising uh, financial capital, uh, seed capital to support um, independently owned and operated clinics that embrace the pollination approach to raising seed capital for them on non-extractive terms. And so that, that I think is, is the big, you know, I think all the other pieces are there. That's the one that we really need to make some progress on. But there's 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 a lot of awareness of that, and there are some efforts underway right now that I think will will probably fix that problem in the relatively near future. So just before Lisa asks her question, I'm just briefly going to share my screen and just point out that um, Carps UK are putting a lot of effort into this um, into the idea of community shares which is uh, not really been designed with <laughs> psychedelic wellness centers in mind, um, but is, uh, I think is one possible model by which uh, these kind of centers, at least in the UK, could be funded. So yeah, it's exciting yeah. to see actually there's, there's some really good work being done or, or, or people have realized this is an important topic even outside of the realm of, of psychedelics. And actually I think it has the potential to uh, transform many different industries for the better if we can kind of get it right and I'm confident we will get it right. Yeah, th th that's really cool. There's another one I'm gonna put, the, hang on, let me just go back to the chat. Um, there's this other organization called Steward and this is a, what they did was they raise, they use crowdfunding to provide capital for local regenerative um, agriculture producers. And it's been really successful. And one, this is the really cool thing about it. So initially when they started, they were, I guess the, re the returns um, that were being given. So I guess, I guess they're, they're using debt instruments of some sort and the interest rate. So, so again, you have people in their local communities basically lending their money to finance these operations. And the interest rate was 9%, mm -hmm. which is, so you know, it's not nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the interest rate is now 3%. And the reason it's declined to 3% is that the lenders wanted to reduce it. <laughs> they wanted to reduce it because this is, and this is, in my yeah. mind, this is perfect evidence of, of, of this, this is the kind of process I envision happening with the pollination approach. I think that because they've recognized that there are a lot of white, that these kind of widespread non-quantifiable benefits, which they're, which they're enjoying themselves. And so they're willing to accept less of a return on their financial capital. And, and that's, and, and so, you know, when you ask about, you know, what if there are different models in the industry, which one, you know, is, is one going to win? This is why I think we're talking about two completely different games. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that as these, these new paradigm organizations have a chance once they've been up and running for a few years and they have a chance to demonstrate the widespread benefits that they create then people will get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think just, I just, I just dropped one more thing in briefly. Sorry, Lisa, but that, and it's kind of touches on Kenny's uh, point before, which is, I mean, one, one can hope in time that actually increasingly we will elect governments that do align profit with, the collective good you know like the, the 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 classic example is a carbon tax right it's like there's we're not accounting for that like that major externality and thus we get something like climate change because we're not pricing that properly and you people also talk about like an like an amazon tax in the context of you talk about these you know kind of internet companies extracting wealth from local communities is that they're, they're, they're producing huge and ne negative externalities in the context of of local communities which and my hope also is that that, that kind of wider policy environment will soon become favorable and mean that actually it's 
uh, as profitable, if not more profitable to kind of like, you know, do, do the right thing. And it's not like if you're doing the right thing, you kind of have to start off feeling like you're totally. kind of coming from behind or hamstrung, but that's, yeah, we'll see. No, I, I, I'm, I'm in complete. <laughs> I, I, I think this idea that you have to give something up in order to do the right thing. It, it, it's just, it's bullshit, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and but, but, it, but it's, it's an, the existing system has an interest in perpetuating that idea mm -hmm. because they, the existing system just wants to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. you know? And to mm -hmm. replicate itself, yeah. so so that type of thinking is heretical. That the whole idea, look, the whole idea that we can solve. Yeah, I don't know if you if you're aware of this book, Winners Take All. I haven't read it. No. It came out last year. It's by Anand and Giridharadas. Is how you pronounce his last Giridharadas. name. Giridharadas. Mm. Say it again. Anand Giridharadas. Giridharadas. I I I, th I thought I'm, I've been missing a syllable. So so thank you. Um, and yeah, what he basically says is, look, if you know, you can't fix the problems the existing system has created using in, using the instruments of the existing system. So the idea that like the Gates Foundation or, or something like that, this is an example, is going to fix our problems for us is, is, is foolish. And, and you just, you, you need to, and again, you, we have to just shift the entire paradigm that we're kind of using to think about this stuff. Mm, nice. Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, a couple things. I wanted to add, uh, there's also an organization in the U.S. called the Sustainable Economies Law Center. They're also working on um, ways of not only, uh, I hate to use the term raising capital, but it's really just about um, community generated uh, wealth, you know, wealth accumulation, and they also have really innovative methods of community ownership and community engagement. So oh, it's cool. really about building community leadership, and um, they are the SELC dot org. Uh, the the, the SELC. SELC, sorry, LC dot. Trying to write it in the chat. It keeps going back. Sorry, my keyboard's not working. I'll put it in the chat in a sec. The other thing, and I, I apologize. I it's work hours here. I had to dip out for ten minutes during your presentation, but. Um, you know, I'm wondering, I know you talked about the downstream effects of the wellness centers, a more integrated approach on the effect on community, but I'm just wondering if we look at some of the sources as well, is there a way for a wellness center or this whole approach to also heal some of the sources of, you know, oppressive conditions, whether it's economics or racism or other forms of oppression that could we really be looking at, you know, what are the sources and healing that at the same time, rather than just kind of working with the downstream effects. Um, that's one thing. And the other is, you know, when I think about these kind of healing centers, I'm thinking about a lot of my work is in climate justice. And we think a lot in terms of this idea of creating um, like resilience hubs or, or just ways of really building community that may not be wellness or psychedelic focused, but there might be other um, ways of thinking about food and water security, yeah. uh, community ownership of housing or land. Um, yeah. We, I mean, here in the States, of course, you know, um, we call it rematriating the land, like bringing land back to indigenous people, ownership of indigenous people. So I guess I'm just wondering, does your model kind of include this? Or it seems like it would be beneficial because well, we have so little time, right, to, you I, know, I, I, which way humanity is going. So, so yeah. the part... So the pollination approach is not just about psychedelics. This is an application in psychedelics, but my my broader interest is in um, is is in trying to promote the emergence of new paradigm economic patterns. And and to me, a big piece of that is relocalizing economic economic activity and rededic rededicating the mission of community to to the thriving of the community rather than the production of concentrated shareholder profit. So, yeah, so, so I, I com I'm completely on board with what you just said. And, and, you know, I have a lot of other projects that I'm working on, which I think address, address that in one way or another. I mean, we have the, um, on the title slide, and I, I think in Stephen's introduction, he mentioned that I uh, recently co-founded an organization called the Transformative Capital Institute. And our mission is to support regenerative economic initiatives. So you know, we're doing work not, not just in psychedelics, but also in regenerative agriculture, uh, to, to name another. Um, 
we're also doing work on projects that we refer to as meta layer projects. So these are developing kind of technologies that can be used to um, to revitalize uh, local commerce patterns. So um, we have a cryptocurrency project. We have a governance project. So yeah. So so this so the, the short answer is yes. So uh, uh, you had two questions, and I don't know if I got to the other one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I what it, yeah, that was great. I, I'll just want to mention um, there's an organization called Gesturing Toward Decolonial Futures, and they just put out a call for accountability in plant medicine experiences. This was published in Chakruna. Um, oh, cool. And I think it's just, it's a really, I just really appreciate that framework. So I guess I just wanted to include that framework that as we think about building, we might also think about decolonizing as well. And I would just say, I'm, you know, I find myself complicit in these systems as well. So I feel this is a, I just want to bring this into our uh, collective inquiry. Uh, it, totally. And in fact, I, first of all, I fully agree with you. And what I'm looking for right now, and if I can't find it quickly, I will, I'll just tell you what it's called. There was an article about decolonizing the psychedelics movement. Um, and it was a really good article. Um, well, I can't, I, I, I had it, I thought I had it saved here, but I, I don't see it. But if you, uh, here, I'll, I'll Google it, see if I can find it for you. Um, this is from a new publication. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, so I'll, I'll just put this in the chat. It, it's a long article, but it's it's exactly on the topic that you were just talking about, and it's very it's definitely worth reading. Nice, I haven't seen this. Yeah, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. This publication, it's a new publication on psychedelics, and I I think what someone told me is that the person or the people who started it used to publish Wired. Mm -hmm. So it's got some, there's a couple of interesting new publications like that. There's another one called Double Blind. Yeah. So yeah a bunch nice. of new stuff coming out. Okay, we've, so we've, uh, we're about to hit half seven UK time at least. So uh, I think it's probably time to, to wrap up. So uh, maybe I'll give it Bennett you, a last opportunity for any kind of closing thoughts or anything else you want to kind of direct us to point, us, point out. Wow, that, that's, that, that, that's, uh, um, I mean, I think we've had a, a very comprehensive discussion. You know, normally, kind of in terms of closing comments, something that I often come to is, is this idea that we're in this, but I've already talked about it, is this idea that we're in a state of meta crisis right now. Mm -hmm. And as anxiety provoking as that may be, it also, you know, really, I think it really holds the potential for true change. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's, you know, on all of us to, to act as agents of change mm -hmm. um, in this critical window. So I think that's probably my concluding comment. <laughs> Nice. Thanks. Well, certainly your your work and your delivery even gives me a lot of, of optimism oh, for the future. You. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a pleasure. I think I might connect with some of the, the people that you mentioned this this day, but North Star for some yeah. future episodes in this kind of uh, he, yeah, he's future great. series. He's great. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so hopefully be seeing some of the, of the rest of you back for some of these and um, these, yeah, these future editions of this series. Thanks so much for attending and yeah, see you all soon. Well, well, thanks for having me. It was a nice, and thanks everybody for, for, for coming. It was a nice uh, sort of meeting you all. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'll pop in for a future one as well. So nice I'll one. see you cool. in that case. All right, take, take care. care. Bye.